Praise God. You can be seated, and it is just an honor to be in this place and in the presence of the Lord, and an honor to be with you tonight. Amen. Most of my adult life, I have had a curiosity in my mind or my heart about turning points in people's lives. Uh, I'm talking about that moment when people completely surrender everything to the Lord. And um, I know many times that surrender seems to be at one defined moment. Uh, maybe somebody comes to church and they feel the tug of God in their heart, come to an altar of repentance and, and uh, maybe even re are baptized, receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But maybe there are things that they grapple with for uh, some time after that. I don't say that in a disparaging way. Just maybe there are things they're trying to get their hands on. I, I'm not, or their mind around, and I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about, um, you know, believing in God, but just getting their legs gathered under them. But there just seemed to come a point where most people just surrender. And they just, like, whatever it takes... And the debate is over, whatever that debate may or may not have been in their mind. And they have just settled and they've cashed in and they said, this is what I'm going to do. This is where I'm going. And, and um, everybody here tonight, people joining us online, have made that same crossover. You, you cross that divide. Maybe you can define that for yourself, what it was. Maybe it was a moment. Maybe it was an event but the bottom line is that generally our flesh doesn't like to surrender. Amen. Just, just doesn't like to surrender. I've told the story many, many times about the young mother that was trying to get her little boy to sit down in church and sit down, sit down, sit down. Finally, he sat down, but he told her, I'm still standing in my heart. <laughs> in, my, in my spirit, I'm still standing and uh, I know there's different methods and ways that some of you would approach that kind of comeback. But nevertheless, uh, I believe we could have got him to sit down both ways. And uh, <laughs> there's some here tonight that would have that ability. But flesh doesn't really like to surrender. That, it's just not in us. So when we say that we don't like to surrender to God, it's, it's not because we're you know, trying to be anti-God. But it's just our flesh. Our flesh doesn't have an easy surrender button in it. Amen. And we need those. We need those. And uh, uh, just, uh, just last night, as a matter of a few days ago, I got a call. Somebody had, had been given a few things for their shop. And he said, I've just no way I can get these things. And if you'd like to have them, I'm just going to call you and tell you that you could have them in my stead. I'll call these people if you want them. And, so I said, you know, I just think, I, yeah, I'd like to do that. And so last night, the owner of these things called me, and uh, he said, well, I got the message that, that so-and-so can't take it, but that you'll take it. And he said, I, I see that you can't find your no button. <laughs> I was just like you. It took me just a moment. <laughs> it took me just a moment to catch that. And uh, so then he started describing these things and how difficult it was going to be to go load them up and, and how you know, you're going to need to bring two or three people with you to come get these things. And I realized that he's talking about one thing. In my mind, I was thinking about another thing. And while he was talking, I just interrupted him. I said, would you look at there? I just found my no button. It was, <laughs> it was in the back of the drawer, but I found it. I found, I found that 
I found that no button, and we can just abbreviate the rest of this conversation. You don't have to convince me anymore. And so sometimes we have a hard time finding that surrender button, whatever it may be. But there is a moment that we too say, well, look at there. There it is. There it is. Flesh doesn't like it. And so many times God has to place us in a situation to help us realize how much we need him and how much we need his spirit. And that's where we can find many people in life. And that's where we can find many people in scripture. One such place is in the book of Exodus chapter 9. And we, I read this many times over and I'm just amazed at, at uh, how this story unfolds. <coughs> Nevertheless, Exodus chapter 9 deals with Pharaoh. And finally, when we get seven plagues deep, if you know the story, we're seven layers into this story. <laughs> and there is, uh, there is hail and fire that is being rained down from heaven. Exodus chapter 9 verse 28, Pharaoh says, it is enough. Entreat the Lord, for it is enough that there be no more. I'm going to let you go. It, it's, it's enough. Now, I, I read that passage of Scripture, and I'm thinking, I could have uttered those words, I think, way, way, way back before fire and hail started falling. Pharaoh was being exposed to the sovereign arm of God, and God has requested for him to let his people go. And, and so Pharaoh somehow in his flesh and ego decides that I've just got to prove myself. And so God pulls the trigger on the judgment of Egypt and the plague. Again, like I said, seven, seven plagues deep. And it was devastating. This, this plague of hail and fire was devastating for their country because the hail was striking as their crops were coming in. So this was not just an inconvenience or let's put the car into the carport so there's no dings in the top or the hood. This is talking about their economy that's going to be devastated. And so, and, and then, then we, he, we see all of this in, happening in Egypt. But then if you pan the camera over to Goshen, we see that over God's people, hail wasn't falling. And, and, uh, the, and the fire wasn't falling. And the crops and the animals were protected. And God's people were spared because God kept them separate. And it didn't take long Pharaoh for Pharaoh to get in touch with Moses. And, and he said, you need to entreat Jehovah. You need to entreat God and tell him that it is enough. It is enough. Pharaoh thinks that just because he's had enough of God, that God feels that Egypt has had enough. Amen. And that's not the case. It's apparent that Pharaoh has had enough for, of God for a moment. But in the heart of Pharaoh, he had not changed. It was just enough in the moment. He thinks that he can continue his life. He thinks that he can enjoy his life. And his, he thinks that his nation can just continue to do as they please. But God was on a different path. And God had a different agenda. The Bible tells us a powerful story about a man much like you and I. We can find ourselves in, in a man by the name of Elijah. It's 1 Kings 19. We may not want to admit how much like him we are, but we can find ourselves in him. He loved God. He was used of God. Elijah believed in God, but he had some things come his way that he did not understand. And he failed to see the hand of God in what was going on because God doesn't always reveal his hand. He doesn't ever feel the necessity to have a tag in meeting with me and let me know kind of what's going to unfold in this situation. He failed to see the hand of God in, in, in that moment. He got so discouraged and so disheartened and so full of pain that in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse number 4, the Bible says, He himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die because he said, It is enough. It is enough. And that is the title of my message tonight. It is enough. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for am I not better than my father's? And so Elijah, just simply put, we're, we're not again standing at a, on some pedestal tonight looking down our nose at him self-righteously, but Elijah thought he had been through enough. He felt like that he couldn't take any more. As a matter of fact, he was so transparent and so honest that he said, it would just be better for me if this would all end and my life would be over. He was trying to convince God that he had had enough. But he was soon to find out that it just wasn't quite that easy. 
And there are some experiences in life, and I, I, I can speak to this tonight, and, and I know many of you, if not all of you, can speak to the fact that there are experiences that we encounter in our life that completely zap our strength and challenge our faith. Amen. And I can appreciate that you didn't get up and run the aisles on that, but it's the truth. Our faith gets shaken at times. Our confidence, not in God, but our faith, our, our confidence, because we're frail flesh. There are times we think that we're just absolutely the end of the road, and we might, like Elijah, think it's enough. I mean, this is just enough. But in that moment, God visited him. And here's where we've got to, what we have to do. We've got to keep reading this story because Elijah sat down exhausted. We're not belittling him and we're not minimizing the fact that he was exhausted. He had fought a great battle. And I know that sometimes we think, Elijah, how could you come down off Mount Carmel with such a great experience and now find yourself under the juniper tree? But I can tell you that sometimes it's not, we, it's, it's not in the middle of the battle that we have to worry. It's in calm waters. You can drown in calm waters. It doesn't have to be a raging river. You can drown in calm waters. And so Elijah was exhausted. It, was, it had to be. If you, I, I know that we preach the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel and we talk about it and teach it. I'm not thinking and saying that we're in error, but we emphasize on the battle won and we emphasize on the God that answered by fire. We emphasize that Elijah came out uh, victorious and the prophets of Baal failed but this was an emotional roller coaster this was a job this was a task because Elijah was a man of God but let's not forget he was a man he was flesh he was standing at himself and uh, standing by himself rather uh, as far as the flesh is concerned and so in that but when Elijah said it's enough I just can't take any more if we stop reading there then we would fail to get the real message because in that moment God visited him and said essentially it's not enough it's not enough rise and eat because the journey that is ahead of you is great Elijah is trying to put a period at the end of the sentence and the Lord with his divine hand reaches down and he raises that period and puts a comma and said there is a great journey ahead of you. You are not done. And this is what makes uh, perhaps, and I don't want to get into anything more but here, but this is what makes suicide such a tragedy because it's man's opinion versus God's opinion. And I, I don't ever want to know what would drive someone to that point. And so I do not say this again in any way of sounding judgmental or trying to be a judgmental. But the Bible says that we have an enemy. We have an enemy of our flesh and that enemy is called Satan. Amen. The Bible says in the prayer of Jabez that we ought to pray that the Lord would preserve us against the evil. Amen. That evil is not just some mystical no name. That evil is Satan himself, Lucifer. Amen. That evil is the power of, of evil. And we need to pray that God would preserve us. Amen. That he would pickle us. That he would keep us. That he would hold us in these times. Amen. The Bible says we have an enemy. And the Bible calls that enemy a liar. The Bible calls him a thief. The Bible calls him a murderer. Amen. This is the flesh. Amen. He would love to destroy our flesh. Why? Because he understands the beautiful thing that is inside that earthen vessel and that is the spirit of a living God. And so if he could destroy the flesh, then he destroys the gift in his mind at least of God. But God knows what he is doing and I've got to place my trust and my confidence in him. And I want you to look at me close and I want want you to observe me careful tonight. I do not have any pom-poms in my hand. I'm not trying to rally you to believe that you can do something that you cannot. I'm here tonight to stand on the word of God. Amen. I'm standing not on my opinion, but I'm standing on the word of God tonight to tell us that God knows what he's doing and we can place our trust and we can put all of our confidence in him. 
Amen. I went to school in Mayo. I've said this before. I went to school in Mayo uh, as a young man. And as long as I guess as time has been, the uh, clock has been ticking anywhere, there are, it's common to have rivalries among towns. And, and so there was a great rivalry among Mayo and Brantford in, in every sport, no matter what it was. And, and I could just remember in the time that I was going to school, uh, that's when, I mean, Brantford was just leading the way. I mean, there was just, they, Mayo, we just couldn't get on our feet to save our lives. And I just remember going to those pet rallies and those pet rallies, and they were saying, You can do it. I mean, if you can't do it, nobody can. You know, and. <laughs> And we're all just sitting there, and you're wanting to believe them. You're wanting to buy into that message, but we know. I mean, I was not a football player, but but they wouldn't even let me on the football field. But anyway, I was certainly wasn't on the team. But those men, those young men, had to know we're just hours away from another slaughter, and they were. And so tonight, this is not my feeble attempt to tell you, yes, you can. Yes, you can. If anybody can do it, you can. No, I'm talking about the Word of God. Amen. I'm telling you, based on the Word of God, that there is no problem. There is no situation so deep. Amen. There is no river so wide. There is no mountain so tall. There is no valley so deep that God will not, cannot see us through. Hallelujah. Amen. He will. He will. We have all found ourselves, for whatever reason, in a totally dark room. It's very bright in here right now. You can see your way around. But if we turn these lights out and just in an instant, we would all in that moment be in an absolute dark. You can trust me on this. I've been here in this building many times in the absolute dark. But just be still. Because here, just like in your home, there are tiny little lights and, and, and they may be on for here instruments or some of our exit lights or things of that nature. But in your home, maybe a little less conspicuous than our exit lights and things of that nature. I mean, there's going to be a little green light over here and a little red light over there and a little orange light over there. And it's not a lot of light. And, and we can almost wonder where that light came from. But you see, that light was burning all the time. It didn't just come on because the main lights went out. When the room was illuminated, that little light was not noticeable. And it wasn't important. But in a totally dark room, even the smallest light becomes tremendously important because it, it reminds us of where we are. It repositions us. That's where the stereo is. This is where this is in the home. That is the, that's the fire detector. We, we, along We've got everything down and it brings back a position in our life. This light in the darkness, amen, is one of the greatest powers and benefits of the Holy Ghost. Yes, I'm thankful. I'm an emotional person and I love to feel the presence of the Lord. It doesn't bother me for somebody to watch me pray. It doesn't bother me for somebody to watch me worship. I don't even think about, don't mean this in the cavalier, but I'm not worried about what they think about my lifted hands or my closed eyes or if I'm praying in another language. Language. I don't think about that because I realize, and I love that, but that's not the greatest benefit of the Holy Ghost. The greatest benefit of the Holy Ghost outside of making heaven our home is the fact that when I sit in darkness, God will be a light unto me. Amen. There's always going to be something that points the way, always going to be something that repositions me and reminds me of where I am because he is light in a totally dark world. When Matthew was trying to describe Jesus to us, there was only one way for him to make the statement that he wanted, and that was the difference between light and darkness. And so he uses this contrasting image. Matthew 4 and 16, The people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in, in the region in the shadow of death, light is sprung up. This is not a random passage of scripture because when Matthew said this, when Matthew penned these words, he penned these words in the dark. It was a very dark time. It was a very dark season. Most people thought that the Lord had disappeared and that there was hope and that there was no goodness and that there was nothing left. However, in the midst of this darkness, the Lord robed himself in flesh, in the flesh of Jesus Christ, and he became the light that filled a dark world. Praise God. I am so thankful for the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm Yes, I'm glad when I feel it moving in my heart. I'm glad when I feel it in my hands. I'm glad when I feel it 
in my feet. I'm glad when I feel it all over me, but I'm also glad that when I feel like I have reached the absolute end of myself and I sit down and I wonder where to from here, there is something bold in my heart that says this little light of mine. There's something in my spirit. There's something in your spirit. It's his power. It's his presence. Amen. Most people when they feel that there is a total absence of hope, give up on their lives like Elijah. However, God visited him and he said, you said it is enough, but I am telling you essentially it is not enough. And then the Lord said, you need to get up. You need to wash yourself. You need to eat. The journey ahead of you is great. You've got to... You've got a great journey. What did that journey consist of? If you're a a student of the word of God, you know that the Lord was telling him, you need to go anoint the next prophet. You're going to go declare the next king. And then he gave him a powerful message that none of us should ever forget. And that is that he said, I want you to know one more thing, Elijah, that I have 7,000 that have never bowed a knee to Baal. I know you think it's all over. I know you think that the gig is up. But I'm going to tell you that though you can't see see it though you don't understand it I want us to know tonight that there are those I know it's been said over and over in the last couple of services here ironically enough I've been in other services in recent weeks and I've heard this same thing uttered it just feels like the spirit of this statement must be in the air and that is the reason the church is still here is because there are still people that are hungry and they're on their way amen that is again not some vague statement they're on their way not just to the church they're on their way to this church and that's why we got to keep the lights on amen I'm not just talking about these lights but that's why we got to keep the lights on that's why we got to keep our heart right and our mind right and we got to keep our focus hallelujah amen the Lord said I've got those that have never bowed God was telling Elijah there is still light in this darkness and so we have to keep pressing on Until God pulls the trigger on judgment as it is described in the book of Revelation, we have an obligation to keep the faith. I have an obligation. We have an obligation to build God's house and to keep God's business in order. Amen. To keep God's business prospering. And we can't look at the times and we can't look at the seasons and then put our lives in neutral. I realize this world is a mess. Some of has, has already been said about that tonight, and we are inundated. We are inundated with the mess that this not our nation is in. We're inundated with the mess that our world is in. Amen. I, I'm, not, I'm not here tonight to try to explain all of this to you or explain it all away. But I'm just going to tell you this, that the world is in a mess and we may be looking around and saying, Lord, when is enough going to be enough? Amen. We might think this is enough, but the Lord is saying we need to wash ourselves. We need to refresh ourselves. We need to rise and eat because the journey ahead of us is great. Until the trumpet sounds, amen, I pray that we are leaning in. I pray when the Lord Lord comes, he catches us with our hands firmly to the plow, not looking back, not distracted in some other area of life. Amen. We need the power of God to touch us. Enough is enough. Most of you may remember the story, the Old Testament story about David numbering Israel and when he did so, it made God angry and and, and the Lord gave David three choices. He could pick his poison. You've got three choices of your judgment. You're going to cut your own switch. Amen. I'm in the Word. It doesn't say switch. So don't Google that, but I'm in the book. But it made God angry, and and, and David had to choose between three punishments. He wisely chose to fall into the hands of a merciful God. And if you have a choice, that's my suggestion. The death angel began to sweep through the land. You can read it in your Bible. Over 70,000 men died at the hand of the death angel holding that sword. And then, just as the angel was headed to Jerusalem to destroy more lives, a tremendous thing happens, but it's a baffling thing. And in 2 Samuel 24 and 16, this is what we read. When the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented of his evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, It is enough. Stay thy hand. Amen. I'm not trying to draw a big question mark in your hand, nor am I trying to draw one in your Bible. But God told the death angel, It's enough, and judgment stopped. And I have... 
No idea we could debate this of the coming of the Lord. Why did it take 70,000 men dying? Amen. Don't you think if we had been part of that, that many people thought this is enough? I think it's fair to say when the first man died, somebody thought, hey, wait, we, we, we might better rethink this. When 10 died, when 100 died, when 1,000 died, whoo, we need to entreat the hand of God. I don't know why it was 70,000. I haven't come to the pool. You can put your, your, your pencil and, and your ledger away. I'm not here to answer that question of why it took 70,000 men. Amen. But I know, amen, that we know that one of these days when the trumpet sounds and God calls us home to be with him, we don't know why the Lord is tearing his coming. We look around and think this is a prime time for the Lord to come. And he could come tonight. I'm not trying to undergird that or, or, or underwash the truth of that statement but if we're honest we have all wondered why, what's the Lord waiting on but you see the Lord it's not going to be finished until the Lord says it's finished the Bible says as it was in the days of Noah so shall it also be my goodness are we there and we didn't just get here yesterday we've been here a while we've been here a long while but until God says so the earth is going to keep turning and the tide is going to keep going out and it's going to keep coming in. But when God says it's enough, that's when we better watch out. When God says it's enough, this world is going to be consumed with fire and a new heaven and a new earth is going to be created. And I want to be clear about something tonight. God is not in the killing business. He's in the redeeming business. He came to redeem the world. I mean, his primary objective was not to be the judge of sin, but... But one day, one day, the dispensation of grace is going to end. And when that day of grace ends, the day of judgment, the dispensation of judgment is going to begin. And he will put on the robe of final and eternal judge. And that I, in that instant, all sin will have to answer to God. Proverbs, <clears throat> Proverbs 30 and uh, 15 and 16, Solomon Solomon in these two verses gives an interesting take on something. He said, there are three things that are never satisfied. Yea, four things that say not it is enough. There are four things Solomon says it's enough, that will never say it's enough. In verse 16, he says, the grave, he lists them. The grave, a barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and fire. And so Solomon was, of course, speaking naturally in, in, in natural terms, and he had it right if we look at it in the terms of natural things. The grave seems to never be satisfied. The grave will take young or old. It doesn't matter. The grave will take them. A barren womb of a woman never seems to be properly satisfied. The earth brings up all the water that falls from the sky. It just doesn't matter how much rain how many times have we looked out in our own yard and said, it just looks like a lake or it looks like a pond. We just hang on. Because the earth is never satisfied. And it'll just pull it down. It'll pull it down. and We can ride by ponds and rivers and streams. And, and, and in times of plenty, we can just see them so full, but just hang on. Because when it comes just a little bit of dry... The, the credit it begins to fall. And the, and the fir, fourth thing that Solomon talks about is fire because fire burns until it can't find anything else to burn. As long as there's fuel, it will burn. But there's another side of this whole story, and that's the spiritual side because according to the, to the word of God, there will be a day when the grave will give up its dead. It won't just be satisfied, not take another. It's going to have to give up its dead. And there will be a day when the barren woman will be glad and she'll realize she's better off than those with children. There, there's a day that the earth won't drink up the water anymore, and there's a day that the fire is going to utterly consume everything. So I hope that we have purpose in our heart to, together not to be on this earth when that calamity falls and judgment has taken place. Amen. I, I just say, Lord, I don't want to be here. I don't want to, I don't want to be here. Amen. I, I, want, I want something that never says it's enough. That one thing that never says it's enough is going to be praise and it's going to be worship. I'm going to tell you, if, if, if church makes you nervous here, heaven's going to drive you crazy because it's going to be never ending. There's going to be a praise. There's going to be a worship. Amen. It's a paradise. It's a place called heaven. It's because when we get there, we're going to know that he is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. We won't have bodies that get weary, voices that give out. 
Amen. We're going to be able to magnify him for the eternal ages long. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 25, Jesus said, It is enough for a disciple that he be his master, his servant, and his Lord. Jesus said, It is enough. It is enough for a servant to be like his master. And so if my master is Jesus Christ, then I want to be like him. I want to talk like him. I want to think like him. I know we don't have his mind. His ways are not our way. I know they're above ours, but I can keep reaching like Paul. I can keep pressing. I can keep reaching and stretching myself every single day to hunger and thirst to be more and more like him. And in short, um, a disciple is just going to be like him. I want to turn our attention to Luke. This is my second hour of scripture right here. Doing pretty good, aren't we? Luke chapter 22, verse 35. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked you anything? And they said nothing. Jesus talking to his disciples. First time he sends them out, says, Don't worry about anything. I'm going to take care of it all. The second time he sends them out, he reminds them, When I sent you out, you went out with nothing, but you didn't lack anything, right? No, we didn't lack anything. Then he said unto them, verse 36, but now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his script. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me have an end. And the Lord, and, and they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. I know this is a little bit of a confusing scripture. It seems a little confusing because it sounds like one minute that Jesus is telling them, I sent you out the first time without anything, but now you need to sell whatever you can and get yourself a sword. <laughs> and in fact, it almost it implies that you sell your clothes, sell your garment to get a sword and buy one. And then in a just a few hours later, Peter, Simon Peter grabs his sword and the Lord rebukes him. And, uh, and the Lord is obviously upset because he uses his sword. <laughs> and, um, and it's obvious that the disciples and myself perhaps have misunderstood some of this. But in those days, everyone traveled with a sword. A sword was a common part of your garment. I, I know what we look at that today almost as a costume and somebody's in dress up or make believe or they're going into battle. But, but they carried a sword in an attempt to provide some sort of protection. It was a, not just a protection against somebody robbing you, but they're wild animals and, and all manner of things you had to protect yourself against. And so it's evident that Jesus carried no sword, but he didn't have a problem with those around him carrying a sword. And so he tells them that they better get a sword. As a matter of fact, you should, you should sell everything you have or whatever you have to get a sword. And so at the ending of what we just read, not the whole chapter, of course, or book, but at the end of what we just read, one of his disciples did a quick inventory, and he said to, to the Lord, he said, hey, we've got a sword. As a matter of fact, we've got two. And Jesus' reply to that was, it is enough. So I ask you this, how can two swords be enough for 12 men? It doesn't add up. Why wouldn't there need to be a minimum of 12 swords? Some of you are reaching for your legal pad again now. <laughs> but none of them knew what Jesus knew. He knew what was coming. They were living in the moment. Jesus knew of the soldiers that were coming their way in just a few hours. And Jesus knew of the beating and the cruel trial and the mocking and the insurrection that was coming at daybreak. And so how could Jesus think for one minute that two swords were going to be enough to defend he and his men from the trouble that was coming their way? In the flesh, those two swords would never be sufficient 
for this entire group of 12 men to defend themselves of the danger that was coming. However, these two swords were enough. They were enough because this is a great sword. There was something that was with them that was greater than the sword. There was something flanking them that was more powerful than what they could see. I know sometimes we look around and we think, I don't have enough. This is not sufficient. What we have is not enough. It is not sufficient. But I'm going to tell you tonight that we need to put our pen and paper away and stop counting and saying well we just have two swords and when he said we've got two swords he was rather proud of that we've got two swords and the Lord said that is enough can I tell you amen in our connect groups or whatever it may be when we gather and we look around and we think I don't know if there's enough to do any good here tonight let me tell you it's enough it is enough because God is in our midst when we look around and we think well we're lacking here or we may be lacking there but I want to tell you where we're not lacking we're we're not lacking when heaven is involved. We're not heaven. We're not lacking when Jesus is standing with us. And that ought to be good news to us. Because when Jesus said it's enough, it'd be enough. The widow woman said, All I have left, it's enough. It's enough. As a matter of fact, it's more than enough. I mean, I'll, I'll ask our. I'll just ask you to stand. Musicians, you can just stay where you are if you'd like. Just stand with me. We are adamant about a few things as we should be because the Word of God is adamant. The Word of God is unyielding. The Word of God is unbending. Amen. We preach adamantly the essentiality to believe in God. That's where we have to start. Have you received since you believed? We've got to believe. We've got to have that settled in our heart. We believe in the power of repentance because that's what the Bible teaches us, that we must repent of our sins. Amen. And we believe in baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins because that's what the Bible teaches us. Amen. We haven't written our own set of rules and we're trying to push that on the rest of the world. We're just preaching out of the book and that we must be baptized by immersion. Amen. We must call on that name. That blood is applied in baptism. It is symbolic. Amen. We are buried with him. Amen. We believe in a living power of the Holy Ghost in dwelling the heart and the mind the soul, the spirit perhaps of, of a man or a woman and we believe that, we're adamant about that, amen, call us whatever we're hung up on that because the Bible's hung up on it amen I know we're living in a world that would love us to put everything on wheels so that we can move this when it's inconvenient and we can move this when it's inconvenient but the word of God is established we believe because the Bible teaches us that we are to live a holy and a consecrated life. And because of some stands that you may take in your own personal life, people may call you legalistic. Amen. And what they're really saying is they're saying we, what we have is enough. You don't have to go that far. You don't have to do all that. You don't have to take it there. Amen. But you see... What we have will never be enough until the Lord says it is enough. And the Lord never did say anything about just believing, just shaking someone's hand, just embracing, just putting our name on a roll. I'm not being unkind tonight, but I have an obligation to stand in this pulpit and tell you that the Word of God doesn't teach us that. God told His disciples what to do, and He told them how to do it. And if we don't follow those examples, then we haven't done enough. We have got to do what the Word of God teaches us. Some will say, well, that's just for those in that day and not for us today. But Jesus is the one that said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. And since we only have one book to go by, amen, and since the Lord has not returned, amen, we, we can't take some passages of Scripture and mark them unimportant. We can't take some and a pen knife and pull that out, cut it out, set it on the shelf, amen, we have got to do what the Lord says we've got to do. Amen. This is not my message. This is his message. Amen. This book was given to us as the Spirit of God moved on holy men. Amen. Lord, I want to do what all you're asking of me. And you said you would never ask me to do more, put more on me than I could bear. 
I want to give myself to you completely. I wonder if we could just across this building and lift our hands and we could lift our voices and just ask the Lord to touch us tonight. And-